of a pro wrestling show is to get over a baby face. That is the purpose. Our purpose, when we play heel, our purpose is to lose at the end. You know, Sean in the 90s, I mean, like, you know, he, he lost his smile because he didn't want to drop the title and all that kind of stuff. We're putting on a show. That's what we're doing. The heel is there to make the baby face. That is our job. That's what made Ric Flair so great. His thing was he made every baby face look great. When you're a heel, you're on a team. People don't pay money to see the heel. People pay money to see the baby face. And so as a heel, that's our job is to, a good, a good booking is essentially, you take a heel, you make him strong over a series of months, and then you get to the big show, the big show, and finally, after theoretically building up all this steam where people want to see him lose, but he always wins, finally, your big baby face beats him. That's the thing. And you put the match together, and it's the baby face that everybody wants to see win against the heel who always does win. That's your basic tension. That is your basic wrestling dynamic all the time. That's how it works. The way you lay out a match is completely up to you and the other guy. A lot of guys, especially these days, and I'd be a big proponent of this, work out almost the whole match beforehand. You can change it as you go, but usually it's done beforehand. The basic rules of thumb are that when you're calling stuff in the ring, it's usually the heel. The heel is in a better position to do it. That's why I played heel in that match. Physically in the ring, you're in a better position when you're a heel to call spots because you set up the flow of the match. When the heel's running toward, the baby face should always be just trying to win, whereas the heel sets up the timing. The heel chooses when to bail, when to roll in, the heat, when to put on a chin lock, when to do a comeback. Um, it's usually the veteran who decides what happens in the match. Like when I'm wrestling Doug Williams, I will say, Doug, what would you like to do, sir? and he'll tell me what he wants to do. And, and oftentimes he's let me put together a lot of stuff, which I really appreciated. It was really nice of him. Um, whereas when I'm wrestling guys who know less than I do or have been around for a shorter time than I do, I will tell them exactly what's going to happen. In the ring, it can go back and forth. And there's plenty of occasions too. Some people are simply more comfortable calling than others. You can have a guy who's been wrestling for two years and he'll dictate a match up to a guy who's been wrestling for 10 years just because he's more comfortable. That's fine too. And in other cases as well, you might have a guy who, for example, if Bret Hart is WWF champion, he's 35 years old, he might be wrestling a veteran who's 10 years older, but Bret is the top guys, the pecking order also has a lot to do with it. If you're ranked higher on the card, you kind of are expected to have more input into your match if you're wrestling a guy who's lower on the card. Uh, questions? Who's next? Shoot away. Um, do you have much control over your wrestling persona, or would it be more the promotion you do? You like, see, th this is a big one, is that there's no right or wrong here, but WWE, you know, who is a big game in town these days, have a strangling amount of control over your persona, and it's not in your best interests. You know, the thing about ECW great is that Paul Heyman would watch these guys, he'd see what they did, and he'd be by and large very hands-off, and he'd let guys experiment and do their thing. Um, Vince kind of does his shows like they're sitcoms, like he's casting characters, but wrestling, we're not very good at that, is the thing. Like when I used to book indie wrestling up in Dublin for a couple of years, my approach was always that I'd watch how a guy wrestle. And when you see a guy move around the ring, you get a sense right away, you know, of like how he moves. And just by meeting him, I mean, if you meet someone and you find him generally high energy or you find him generally dislikable and kind of a bit sardonic, nine times out of 10, You've just found what kind of wrestling personality he's best off having. <laughs> uh, we had a question from here. Yeah, um, do you know if you're wrestling like in, to say, Japan, Germany, foreign mm -hmm. places like that, you know, when you're communicating in the ring, would the language barrier be a problem there? Or would you oh yeah, man, yeah. I, I wrestled um, uh, this six man, we this international six man in 3CW 2006. Uh, a really great opportunity, so sweet of them to put me in that match. Um, so like, I represented America, I had Stevie Lynn and, and uh, Doug Williams from the UK, and we had Takeshi Morishima, who was like, uh, who's one of the world champions in Japan. You guys probably know better than me on international stuff, I'm not really that tight. And uh, Mohamed Yone. And uh, right before we start to work out the match, Mike Grimm walks up to me and he pats me on the back. He says, by the way, a suplex is a brain buster. And he walks off, I'm like, wait, what, what, wait, what, what? And as we're walking out the match, I mean, this is one of the times when uh, Doug Williams was so kind and generous to give me the opportunity to contribute because he's been wrestling so much longer than me and it was really, really generous of him. So uh, I was throwing up some ideas and he's like, and so Doug said, he's like, yeah, Roy, that's a good idea, so we'll do this and this. And then he turns, it was like, Yone had, what was it? Yone had a couple of words of English and Morishima had none. 
So I'd, I'd say something to Doug. Doug say, okay, that's cool. We'll do it like that, and we'll do this with it. So Doug would sort of throw in his own idea, you know, use whatever he liked from my idea. He'd turn around uh, to Yone, and he'd explain it in very broken English. He'd be like, right, now, and he'd do a little bit of miming and stuff like that, and, you know, suplex, yeah, and that thing. And Yone's like, uh-huh, uh-huh. And he turned to Morishima, and Morishima was like, oh, yeah. And, Yone, and Yone's like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And, uh, and Morishima would like, oh, look all the way down to me and be like, <laughs> and, and so I was like, we had this like, whole like, like friggin' Congo line going up and down trying to communicate about the match. Like, they weren't the same words or anything like that. And in the end, it was, it was so awesome. Uh, Mike comes back over. He's like, do you have your match worked out? And I was like, uh, yeah. Mike's like, okay, what's the big high spot? I said, okay, uh, Morshima's going to no-sell for me. I'm going to do reverse. I'm going to go over the top, and they're going to do a big catch. And I turn to Doug, and Doug turns to the guys, and he goes, you got that, right? And uh, Yone uh, turns to Morishima, and he's like, uh, oh, yeah, ha, ha. And Morishima goes, ah, ha, who, ha, ha. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I hope you got that. You know, and he literally, did, he's so funny, that guy. And I never actually spoke a word with him, but he's freaking hilarious. Like, just like the two of them together, like doing this whole thing and going through the high spots. So, yeah, there's some things are common, some things are not. One of the most... Um, basic changes is that when you wrestle in Mexico, they go to the right instead of the left. Like when we're wrestling, uh, if you stand up with me here, Seth, brother, when we lock up, everything is what they call to the left. So if I'm taking a headlock, I take it on my left arm. If he takes a hammer lock, he takes it underneath on the left arm. If we do an arm drag, I'll arm drag him with the left. It's a basic rule, a systemic rule. It means as well that when you get up, you turn to the right because the move is to the left. It's a very basic thing. And it means that you know where the guy's going to move to, you know which arm he's going to take, and it just helps you know what you're doing. Did you guys ever see the self-destruction of the Ultimate Warrior DVD? Yeah. Where they're, they're talking about, oh, Warrior was this raving lunatic. You couldn't understand what he was saying. And then they cut to Edge and Chris Jericho and Christian and these guys quoting word for word of Ultimate Warrior promo from 20 years ago. How many guys promos from one year ago can any of us quote? And we're the hard, hardest of the hardcore wrestling fans. That's a friggin' great promo. You know, when Warrior talked about going into the clouds and having the power and, you know, facing all challenges, the dude stage. believed it. You know, that's why it worked. The dude friggin' believes it. Like, most of us cut that promo, it's not gonna work because that's not where we're coming from necessarily. <laughs> Kevin Nash, I mean, Kevin Nash, his best run was when he was being, when he tries to be the big angry guy. You ever see his WrestleMania 11 promo? Oh, I did, I saw yeah. it with The Undertaker. Yes, we'll do it. it. And it, what, that was WrestleMania 12. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you see his WrestleMania 11 promo, he's like trying to do the big angry man promo. Kevin Nash is not a big angry man. He's trying to, like, you know, ah, this is coming to a head tonight, and I'm going to... And he just loses his train of thought completely, and he goes, ah, uh, I'm going to destroy you, and it's going to be really bad. And he ends the promo, like, ah. Oh. <laughs> you know, because it's not him. And if you watch Kevin Nash, when he's doing, like, the cheeky, chappy, kind of laid-back, cool... Have you ever seen a, a shoot interview with Kevin Nash? Oh, I saw one yeah. WCW. Yes, that's all, the only word I need, brother. I love you. That's the only word I need. When you see a shoot promo with Kevin Nash... That's where his money is. This dude is laid back. That's the dude I want to see. And his whole career, I mean, he would have drawn so much more money. And to be fair, and he said this, and this is true. If you watch his run that did really badly, uh, the attendance went down. It wasn't a good run when he had the world title in WWE in 1994 and WWF. When you watch that run, he's playing this big, angry, tough guy character. And it's so clear that he doesn't mean it. It's so clear that he just wants to chill out with a beer and go, hey, how's it going? And if he did that, he would be so charismatic. Because when he does, man, he is so fucking cool. And that's where his money is. Some people's money is in being cool. Other people's money is in being angry. Other people's money is being, in being funny. If you watch uh, Eddie Guerrero, I was watching him wrestle in a Nitro from 1996 the other day. And he came out, and the people loved him then. You know, he got a good reaction, but he wasn't a superstar. Nobody saw a future world champion. I didn't see a future world champion. I thought he was a great wrestler, but I didn't see a future world champion. And you see him come into the ring, and he's doing like the cheap, what they call the cheap heat thing. You know, sla the uh, uh, slapping the uh, uh, fan's hands. And he comes down doing the whole thing, you know, pops into the rings like doing this thing. And it's fine. You know, it's good. It's the, the happy baby Mac face. The, the, stop talking, brother, okay? <laughs> doing the happy baby face thing. You know, he's like da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Later on, when he gets to WWE and he starts to open up and he starts to really find his stuff when they do the... And it's really racist. The cheating Mexican, it's terrible. I mean, like, it's I really freaking bad, you know? But 
He was freaking hilarious. His sense of humor got to come out. That was Eddie Guerrero's. That's his special quality, his sense of humor. Some guys go their whole careers without finding that special thing, that thing that makes them unique. And when he, you know, he did the match where uh, uh, Stand Up was my brother, it's like, um, he, 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 I remember the sixth man on SmackDown. This is when he was really getting over at the start. And he's doing this whole thing, and it's like, he, he, boom, 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 sixth man, he's one of the heels, and guys get knocked to the floor, and da 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 da, and uh, a guy takes a bump. And he's standing back, he goes, <laughs> and he puts his arm on the guy, he's like this. <laughs> and it's like Chris Benoit, who's on the baby face side, and he goes, no, and he chops him, and the crowd goes like, boom. The way he does it, the comic timing he has, and like, you know, to their credit, people saw that and went, you know, holy Christ, and WWE saw that, to their credit. Questions? Okay, I'll come to you in a sec, Aaron. Uh, yourself, brother? Uh, what well, would be off limits there for like a heel trying to generate a bit of heat? What would be off limits? Yeah. It depends purely on the crowd and the promoter, but there's two kinds of heat that they often break it down to. There's what they call cheap heat and there's real heat. Real heat is when people dislike you for who you are. It's true heat. It's your attitude towards the match. Cheap heat can be like getting on the mic and saying, hey, I think everybody in San Diego is homosexual. That's cheap heat, you know? It's just like, it's an obvious, thinly veiled ploy to get people to boo you. Whereas, if you approach the match, the things you do, like, you know, you roll to the outside, and uh, the, the, the wrestler keeps, is, is chasing you, and you roll to the outside, and grab his female ballet and hide behind her. That's real heat. That's to do with the context of the match, and the context of, of what you're really doing. Um, is there anything off limits? Not really, just depends on your audience. I mean, um, do you have any examples you want to throw out? No, nah, just like, as in, like, what, what, like, would you bring the fans into a, like, fucking anything like that? Uh, say, say again? Like, bring the fans into the match or, you know, like, like, like physically into the no, ring? Not, not physically, like, you know, point them out, be like, you know, like, fucking. You, you can. I mean, I guess this whole thing that, uh, I can't remember if it was Ric Flair or somebody who said it, but it, it, it's so true. It's kind of like, if, if nobody's saying, if the crowd is dead, well, you're walking around, you can turn to somebody who's not talking, or just to anybody, and go, you shut your face, fat boy, and the people will boo. I'll be like, the dude didn't say anything, you know? So you, you can pull that kind of stuff. Uh, I mean, you find that, like, if you watch the best wrestlers in the world, like, if you watch Randy Savage, right? Like, Vince's idea these days has been said many times, it's been said to me before from different promoters, is a baby face should smile, be happy, slap the fans of hands. Steve Austin. You know, it's like, that's, that's again, that's, that's cheap babyface. What, what, makes, what makes me who I am is that uh, f for a few years ago at school, I got bullied. I was kicked in the nuts and I was, let's see, I got, I got, I got an apple spam in my face. I had water thrown on me. I uh, used to get some, I, well, it's happened to me. I also, I also cut my few knees before, so, and what, what, what makes me want to do is, is just that, uh, no, just to prove who I, just show the world who I really am. I don't want to be just some guy that's coming in just saying like, oh, here, we'll give you 10 euro or bucks just to give this guy a knockout. No, I want to be in there, just put myself on the platform where I deserve to be. I don't want to be some guy that's walking in for the money. I want to be placed on the platform, be up there with The Rock, Cena, Punk, Shams, all these guys that inspired me, including Brock Lesnar and Eddie Guerrero. Just be like, like, like them. That is one of the best promos I've seen this year. Anybody want to disagree with me? You put that guy on television saying that? You got a star, man. Yeah. Listen to that shit. That's amazing. I mean, all these like scripted promos about like, well, you know, last week, da 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 da, and da 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 da, and then da 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 da, and then da 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 da, like that someone's telling like a really badly written story. Yeah. That's money right there, brother. That's tremendous. And knowing your base where you're coming from, I could see that work as a babyface or a heel. As a babyface, it's like, and the, the, the difference is very slight. As a babyface, it's that you want to rise above. Yeah, rise. And as a heel, it would be, these guys kicked the crap out of me and now I'm gonna kick the crap out of them. You know, yeah. it's very slight. I could see you working as either. My initial instinct is you might be babyface, but I could see it work either. I could see people kind of turn on you because yeah. you have such a loud personality. Kind of a John Cena thing, really. It's kind of a mixed job. I'm a mix of punk Cena, she has all these guys put together. I just want to prove everybody wrong because for years I've had family, friends, even teachers that said I would never make it. And I just want to prove everybody wrong by doing what I do what my passion is, and that is wrestling. Like, one of my first matches I saw was the ladder match between Shawn Michaels and Razor Ramon. Mm -hmm. Since then, it's just been a passion of mine. It's just been something inside me telling me, go do this, do this. 
And for the last seven years, I've been kind of, kind of holding it back. But now that I have the opportunity to do it, I'm not going to let it go. Awesome. That was another great promo. <coughs> last, the, the greatest power source in the world is a man doing what he wants to do. Where our conscious minds are very limited in terms of what we're doing, why we're doing it, our conscious minds tell us, you're sleepy, you're hungry, you're bored, you're horny. Our conscious minds are not that, that lateral, they're really not. Our unconscious minds, our dreams, they're all down there. The things that actually drive us to do what we do, to treat people the way we do. Trust yourself, listen to yourself. If this is what you really want to do, it doesn't matter how many people you're resting in front of, it doesn't matter how much money you are or not making, do it. And that path will, will lead you to the strongest people in the world, the people who are happy, the guys who are doing what they want to do. They don't give a crap what anybody else thinks. And uh, you're coming from a very good place. I was a previously a chef. Mm -hmm. And like that, every time that I was in the kitchen, mm -hmm. we get streamed at it, to, you know, show that I've always been put down. And so then you're sort of kind of saying, like, you do your best, but your best is never enough. Mm -hmm. They never give you compliments. They never give you... They just, you know, it's a job and you do it and that's it. And, and do, you, do you have specific people who, who like, would kind of wear on your mind yeah, that... Yeah, one particular girl. Yeah? Right, that, and how did, how did she treat you? Uh, like, shit, basically. Really? Yeah. And so when you get in that ring, can you mentally put her in that front row and show her how talented you are? Yeah. Boom, motivation right there. And again, I suppose go... it's, it's kind of family as well. Like, mm -hmm. when you say to people, oh, I, you know, I'm looking to become a wrestler, the first thing they say is, sure, that's fake. That happened to me as well. But like, yeah. how could you fear gravity? Like, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the thing is, is that, and this is this is why wrestling is where the rubber meets the road. If you're gonna get into spandex, grease yourself off, and pretend to fight other dudes, you might as well commit to it. There's no point in going halfway. And when we get into that habit of doing what we want to do and doing it to the best of our ability, the strength it gives you, the energy it gives you, the drive it gives you, because I mean, like, you know. God, or if you believe in God or, or the devil or whatever, did not set up the school system. He didn't set up the leading cert. He didn't decide what questions are going to be asked in science. Nobody chose what your parents' outlook on the world and what they were going to value in you. Nobody chose this. But in here, we can feel what we're meant to be doing. In here, we can feel what's important to us. And listening to that is really important. If, if two weeks into training, you realize that, you know what, you really enjoy watching on TV, but you don't want to train, don't train. It's great that you're here, though. Because you're interested, you came. And for as long as you really want to do this, I recommend doing it to the absolute best of your ability. And the day that you don't want to do this, then move on to whatever else you want to do to the best of your ability. That's the important part. I love to be like a guy who other people would think, yeah, that guy's like the shit, like he's class. Mm -hmm. And he thinks he, he, you can see the confidence in them when they come to the ring. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a matter of pride. Yeah. Do you feel confident in what you're doing in your life right now? Uh, yeah. I don't know, kind of. I'm kind of on the fence, like, about what I'm doing, what I really want to do. Uh, what's the pros, what's the cons? Uh, I guess I'm going to college, which is a good thing, but I'm not entirely sure is that really what I want to pursue in my life. Right. So, well, I'm, I love wrestling, so mm -hmm. just wanted to see, like, could I, can I do it? Like, Well, that, that's not the question. The question is whether you will do it. Yeah. Anybody can do anything. Yeah. Like, like, people are If you set so your mind to it. You know, it's a new fucking Tony Robbins sitting over here. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's, you know, it's not, if you're questioning whether you can do it, then the answer is no. If you decide to do it, the answer is yes. That's about you. You know, the most important thing for any of us to do is look inside ourselves and go, what do we want? It's very simple. Are we going to do it to the best of our ability, or aren't we? For me, something that's been of great help to me is that, you know, when I was growing up, uh, you know, I didn't think I mentioned earlier briefly, my, my folks split when I was 11, and I was really, I became really insecure at the time, because my dad moved back to the States, and I didn't realize until much later, but I felt that I must have done something wrong, and I was really afraid that people were going to leave me, and I felt very alienated from from my friends and I, I just, you know, I screwed up all my relationships. I, was, I, was, I went very much into myself. And as I've come back out of that over the course of years and all that kind of thing, and I found my confidence, I found my voice, it's a wonderful thing because it's helped me to appreciate most everybody has been through something that puts them in a place like that. Most of us have been. And to be in a place like that gives you a real appreciation for how sacred 
opportunity is, the opportunity to be happy, the opportunity to do what you want, the opportunity to feel good about yourself. You appreciate it so much when you've had to work to earn it. It gives you a special appreciation for it and makes you work harder. The best achievers in the, in the world are generally people who've had the biggest struggles to overcome because they're the ones, when you have to fight for something, you really appreciate it, you know? Back in the day, 15 years ago, uh, when I was playing Super Nintendo, it was 50 bucks to buy a game. Now I can download them in three seconds, and I don't, you know? If you have to fight for it, if you have to work for it, you make use of it and you appreciate it. So what you have and your understanding of it is a great gift. And if you continue to be aware of it and use that as an inspiration, I can see you apply that fire to the ring, you're going to be an inspiration to people. And it doesn't have to even come out in the promo. It doesn't matter. The way you conduct yourself from that base is going to make you really, really strong. When I was four years old, our parents split up. We, they were together. I'm sure he can't even remember when they were together, but I do vaguely remember them being together in any moment that they, that they worked together. Mm. I can remember fighting and all that kind of stuff, and you know, lately they've been bringing up stuff that I didn't even know happened, you know. Really? But like, yeah. And you know, as a result of that, we moved around a lot, going to different parts of the cities, going to different parts of the county, some places pretty rough that I didn't even realize were rough at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, just moving from, from school to school, going to different places, meet, meeting new people all the time and never really being able to reside in an area for myself to actually become comfortable. Uh, did, you, did you, as a result, always kind of feel like an outsider? Kind of, but it was, um, it, it was generally, it was a confidence issue. I always, like, people that I look up to in this business now, that nowadays, the people that are great talkers like Dean Ambrose, CM Punk, Chris Jericho, John Cena even, I think he's a great promo, even Paul Heyman. Paul Heyman is probably one of the best heel promos in the business today. <laughs> but uh, I've always been envious of people that can actually you know, command the crowd and be able to articulate their points across very accurately. Mm -hmm. And I was never really able to do that. Lately I've become a bit better at it. Mm -hmm. But growing up I was always a very heavy kid. I mean, when I was eight years old I was probably about 14 stone. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was pretty short too, which wasn't a great combination of things. <laughs> But um, yeah, I didn't have very many friends. I got very depressed in myself. But then one day, I decided to make a change in my life. I decided to start working out, start, you know, involving myself more socially and trying to, you know, broaden my horizons, and become a better person. And that's not me, you know, just coming out and saying, you know, so 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 and so happened to me, you know, bad things, blah 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 blah. I could care less. But this is my life, and I want to take control of it, and I want to actually make the most of my time here. You know. Excellent. And by doing that, you create opportunities for other people to do the same. You know, you allow yourself to be a role I don't model. want to wake up one morning and just think, you know, I'm 30 years old and time is gone, you know? Uh, yourself, brother. Wrestling is pretty much the only passion I have. Mm -hmm. It took me out of a very harsh reality where I got beat up, I got my nose broken. People would talk me down, make me feel worthless, even with girls, rejected, and not even in a traditional way. Just talk, treat me like shit, everyone else friendly. I felt like shit. How, 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 how did you get untraditionally rejected? Well, like, it's not just go up and girls like just don't walk away. You don't ask, ask her out. They just say no. I just go up. We talk. You, you can see in their face they don't want to talk, but they stay there anyway. And they're like, yeah. And then it's different around other people. It's like full-on friendly with other people and then it's completely different with me so I kind of got the sense that there was something wrong with me so that shattered my confidence pretty much and so one day so I was just put on sports channels flicked onto wrestling and after a little while it became a very big passion of mine very cool. it made me feel more determined to, to prove myself that I am worth something, that I can be the best in the world at what I do. I want to be right up there, on top of the world. I don't want to be down here any longer. I'm going to be up there, I'm going to be champion, and I'm going to prove to everybody I am the best in the world. You're the guy who gets in the ring, lunges at the guy, takes him down. He's twice your size, so he turns you over and starts pounding on you. He starts beating you down. You go for a roll-up, you can't get him down. He's pounding on you. You fight back, he hits you once, you go down. You're fighting back, he hits you down. He goes to pin you, you kick out, he goes to pin you, you kick out. You're that guy who the people watch and go, 
You ever see that little dog, you know, the little dog going after, like there's, there's videos on like YouTube of like when you get like, you know, a little dog going after like a tiger, these, these crazy like videos. And what's captivating is that you got this little dude and he won't freaking stay down. He just keeps freaking coming and coming and coming, you know? And it can also work as a heel as well. As a heel, you can walk around, like Danny Davis is a really good heel. You can walk around believing that you're the biggest guy in the world, you know, small band complex thing, and to act like you're the biggest guy in the world, and be the guy who every time the babyface gets on top, you roll out of the ring. It can work in both. The important thing is you have the passion to do it. And when you have that passion, you can make it work in either way and come out on top. It's a beautiful thing. The fact that you feel that you're on the outside is a gift because it gives you a power to move forward. It gives you a power to do things. Most people feel on the outside most of the time. The difference is some of them, most of them, are very good at pretending that they don't. But everybody does. Hands up here, people who don't feel deeply uncomfortable at least once a day. One, two, three, half. I feel deeply uncomfortable at least once a day. I always do, you know? I mean, I'm around somebody, I feel, oh, I said something stupid, I think that someone didn't like me, whatever. You know, it happens to everybody. You're in touch with it, you know what's going on, and you're willing to represent with it. That's a wonderful thing. And, you know, everybody going around, everybody is just, everybody is completely equal. Everybody was born into this world, into this existence, with a completely blank slate, with completely equal status. When people react to you, if you be honest to someone, you walk up to someone, you tell them, it can be simple subtext that you like them, you tell, you're telling them that you want to spend time with them. When you say hello, which is our way of saying I like you, hello means I like you, that's this translation. If they distance themselves from you, if they are negative towards you, if they are mean towards you, it means that they're insecure doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. It means there's something in them where they're not comfortable communicating with someone like that. It might, it might be they look at you and go, this guy's not very popular. I need to hang around popular people to make me cool. That might be where it comes from. That means they're insecure. But the real people, you know, the people who get it will like you. Everybody that you want to be around will like you. I think you're awesome, and I think you got an awesome promo. I've pretty much been watching wrestling the same as since like a walk, really. My brother was a big fan, and he was older, sure. Um, I got into it a lot, but uh, the match that was stand out was SummerSlam 91, Mr. Perfect and uh, Bret Hart for the Intercontinental title. Uh -huh. And it's not really the promo side or anything of it that I like, it's more like going in, being technical and they're telling their story that way. Mm -hmm. I, I just love that. I mean like Kurt Angle, Chris Jericho, you name them, mm -hmm. you know, they're just brilliant for what they do. Mm -hmm. But um. Yeah, like I, I was training before and like I was, I'd be different there again by saying like I did, I lost the passion loads. Because um, like, like WWF was big at the time, but now I, I don't watch it at all. Like I'd watch Ring of Honor there and John Moore sort of that's focused on the wrestling rather than, you know, like the characters or the talking and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I just, you know, like any, any submission moves, just what I just love the way they're put together and how matches play out like that. Something that's important to note at this point, it's not a limitation, but it's just something to be aware of, is that when you look around a room like here and you're six foot two, you're big. When you look around a WWE locker room, you're expected to be a high flyer because like, you know, the six foot two guys are like the small guys, you know, the big guys like seven foot tall. Uh, so we have, you know, it's always been something that's been kind of funny is, is you know, most of the class I've trained are guys, like, like most of us in the States too, are relatively smaller guys. And the guys who are really big in class are small in WWE. So the style of wrestling that you'll want to do or need to do will probably have to be more athletic. To do that, that stark, dark character in wrestling, usually it, it works best if you're much bigger, like if you're an Undertaker size or a Viscera size or something like that. Well, this is just something I've thought about a lot and I mean, growing up I never really had anything, didn't have money, wasn't really good at school, but I have me and I always thought I can do anything I want to do, so I put myself through college, I made a feature film in a year, even though I had zero budget, nobody thought it would happen, but I did it and this is something else I really want to do. Nobody experiences the good feelings, the bad feelings, you know, you're the only person having your experience. There might be an alien planet on the other side of the universe 
with 10 million wrestlers better than anyone on this planet. Should that change anything that we're doing? Nah, no. Nah, not at all. Thank you. <laughs> You know, it doesn't, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a psychological hypothesis no, well, no. because it asks, w does it really matter what other people are doing? It doesn't. It doesn't at all. When we get secure in ourselves, when we some see someone who's better than us at something, it allows us to become better at it too. If iron sharpens iron, if there weren't really talented wrestlers out there or football players or mathematicians Cody or cares. scientists or whatever it might be in all these different fields, we wouldn't have something to aspire to. We wouldn't have something, if we didn't have guys, you know, doing a high jump and next year they get two inches higher and the next year at the Olympics they're, they're two inches higher. If we didn't have people pushing a bar like this, then we wouldn't have something to test us and move ourselves forward. To have talented people on television, to have talented people around us, to have people cutting great promos here, that's wonderful because that gives us an opportunity. If everybody here cut a sucky promo and not a single person here has, um, and then it got to you, it wouldn't motivate you very much, would it? It wouldn't get you thinking very much. It wouldn't give you something to shoot for. Having talented people around you, having talented people up there to aspire to, is just a wonderful blessing. And when we look at it like that, and we take it on for what it is, and you know yourself that what makes you special, there ain't nobody in the world, past, future, will ever be like you with your unique set of skill You've got sets. Presents. About your, dude, seriously. With your <laughs> unique skill set in what you do. Um, your name, where you come from, who you are biologically, the way you think, there ain't nobody like you. Nobody. When you watch wrestlers on television, have you ever seen two wrestlers that are the same? They don't exist. They don't exist. Everybody has something unique. Everybody has something different. So as long as you trust yourself in terms of do this while you enjoy it, the way you enjoy it, gravitate towards the things you enjoy, trust yourself. If I say something you agree with, take it on. If I say something you don't agree with, ask yourself why and go the other direction. Be yourself, and you will have a great time, and that's where you will find your money. So I'm very glad to have you here. As you start to train, there's things that I've done, acting, screenwriting, directing, that when I've gotten into them, I, un I came to understand that my interest wasn't necessarily in being that person or in that place or doing that activity. Enjoying something as a viewer and as a fan doesn't necessarily mean that doing it physically is a thing that is for you. It might be, it might not be, who knows. But there's so many things that I've tried that I was sure that I really wanted to do in the long run that through the experience I realized, you know what, this doesn't put me in the best mood that I could be. This isn't the place that I want to be in. So for yourselves as you go along, be very aware of that, that just because you love wrestling might not mean you want to be an in-ring wrestler. You might find it stressful. It may not work for you, you know? As you go along, you might find out you want to be a manager. You might find out, I started as a wrestling journalist. used to be the editor of World of Wrestling magazine. You might find you prefer to write about it. You might find there's themes in wrestling, like what you're talking about is dark characters. Five years from now, you might uh, win an Oscar-winning screenplay about an outsider character. That might be, this might be part of that journey for you. All things are temporary and all things are transitional. The only thing that we ever have to ask ourselves is, where is our journey taking us right now? And your gut takes you. Today, all you guys, your gut brought you right here. And as long as you're here and give it 100% and find out. And when it's time for it to move you on, which at some point in each one of our lives it will be, because at the end of the day we're people first, our career is second, then it's time to move on. So as you come in, you know, I mean, you love wrestling now, you might find that it's to wrestle, you might find it's to manage, it's to this, to that, or you might find there's themes in wrestling that relate to your life, you move on to something else as well. It's a very creative art form, and wrestling is like, wrestling is like the go-between between theater and Hollywood and stunt work. It's like the third part of that, that triangle. It's like it makes it a wrestling ring. Um, awesome stuff, brother. That, that's great. That's it. Good. And you're taking your time, which I like. You know, speed comes with time. That's not important. Getting it right is the important thing. Let's see it again. Good. Left legs in, back to straight, heads are up. Excellent. One more time. Good. You're doing a great job. Okay. This hand can be slightly up here. Okay. You can, if you like, you can sort of hit him about there, but side up just a little bit. You know? Boom. Good. Good. Very good. One more time. Uh, my name is Darren O'Connor. I am from Reesdale. Um, I suppose what I told Blake earlier is the reason why I'm here is because I want. I've watched wrestling since I was three, um, which is I'm 25 now, so that was 22 years I'd say now professionally. Um, I just always been inspired by the moves that they do, how high they can take bumps, how high they fall, um, you know, just just the magic of how well they move in the ring, basically. My sisters, my cousins, 
they all say to me, oh, how would you get into that? It's fake, it's fake, it's, it's not real. Well, my response to them always is like, how can you fake gravity? I mean, you're gonna, you're gonna fall. You learn how to fall. When you fall, you learn how to fall in the safest way possible. I mean, anybody that grew up through the attitude era saw people getting hit with steel chairs, getting hit with trash cans, broomsticks. It was just mayhem, like. Yeah, but well, my girlfriend isn't too impressed that I don't know because she thinks I'm going to get hurt and I'm going to be in a wheelchair for the rest of my life. But like that, as I said, if you learn the basics, if you get to learn how to fall, you should be okay. You could get injured, you could get a broken hand, you could get a broken leg, a broken toe, but it just comes with it. It comes with the business. Good, and this hand... Okay, keep going, nice and relaxed. One of the key things about this whole thing is just repetition. Like, when you get into the ring, you start overthinking every little thing. You need to do it a million times before you can actually in the context of a match and stop thinking, how do I do it? Instead, you're thinking, what's the next move? You know what I mean? Good. Now, when you're that much taller, the way to compensate on the side is you widen your stance. Oh, the grand. Okay, that's straight. Good, good. I'm going to keep you a little bit straighter still. Your head is still coming a little bit, so let's keep your head back a little bit okay. as you come in. Okay? You want it again? Good. It's a good sound off that, too. There's a nice little slap there. Give me one of you, brother. Good. Come on in. Nice and slow. Good. Now relax. Relax. It's okay. Good. Just like that. Good. Good job. Okay, I'll see you again. Nice and gentle. Good, good, good. You can relax it on a bit. And again. Good. One more time. Good night. Good morning. Okay. How are you boys doing? Good. Now your heads, let's keep your heads a bit further out. Because when you're moving the match, you can clash heads quite easily. So back straight and just keep a little bit of distance, just like this. Come on in and hold it there. Good. Come on in and when you do it, hold it. Okay, now relax, relax, relax. Okay, now. Now. I want to widen your stance a bit. Put your left knee in and your right leg back a bit. Back more? Yeah, get down a little bit. Back down, that's it. Relax. There you go. There you go. You're doing a slight stance. Up. Good. Collar and elbow, just like that. Okay? Heads up. And use yourself too, but I'm going to bend the knees just a little bit. I know he's got a little bit of height on you, so if you're a bit taller, you just extend your, your legs a little bit. You just go down. That's all. Yeah. You extend down until you're at the same height. Okay, one more time. Good. And one more time. Good, good job. Okay, keep going. Okay. Oh, that's good. See it again. Good. One more time. Just hold it when you land it. Okay. You can be a little bit more like that. Relax that there. I'll bring that up slightly, just like that. Good. Now you're taller here, so I want you to extend out your base. Get a little bit lower. Good. Bring that right leg a little bit further back. Good. Just like that. Uh, my name is Nathan Bevan. I'm from Granbarher in the city. Uh, I first heard about the seminar on Facebook. I was just browsing through and I saw the seminar. I was intrigued by that. So I just clicked onto it, messaged Lee, I think it was. And he said, yeah, there's places still. You come on down, it'll be a laugh. So I came down here anyway and I had no experience wrestling at all. Uh, Blake was very nice to everyone and he just made us all feel welcome. Uh, I don't think anyone felt intimidated. Um, we're all kind of, most of us are at the, similar, the same level, not having any experience. I was aware of, you know, you have to train for the in-ring stuff, but the whole, the confidence, the building characters, all that kind of stuff that Blake's telling us about is stuff that I wouldn't have known before. And did you ever think about training for wrestling before? Uh, I had thought about training for wrestling, but being a teenager, no job or anything, the only schools available were up in Dublin, I couldn't afford to go up there. I suppose you have to have a lot of compassion, uh, you have to actually put work into it. It's not just step into the ring, take a few bumps, do a few moves on people. You'll have to develop your character outside of the ring, build your own confidence. Um, it's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff like that will help you outside of the ring in real life as well. Good, okay, now as you're coming in, relax, lose tons of energy, and go nice and slow. You know, when you get really tight with all this stuff, it'll come, it'll come at the same time. Okay, relax, come on in. Good. Uh, my name is Will Toomey, I'm from Dungorny, County Cork. 
I started getting interested in wrestling in around 1997. Um, just when I was at school, I was a loner, quite overweight, and a couple of fellas called me The Undertaker, and I knew who he was, but I was never interested in wrestling or anything. So I went to my friend's house and saw it on Sky Sports, and The Undertaker was feuding with Stone Cold Steve Austin um, on the highway to hell for SummerSlam that year, and I just was hooked right from that straight away. The Undertaker was a major inspiration for getting into the business. Uh, characters like The Undertaker, Sting and Raven would be my three main characters for getting in there. Um, what I also like about The Undertaker is the way he carries himself in his personal life as well. He's no ego about him or anything. He's willing to put young talent over as well and the man is just a legend. Uh, with Sting, I mean his crow gimmick against Hollywood Hogan in 1997 was just fantastic. He, he didn't say a single word for nine months, yet he was the most over wrestler in that year by far and away. The Undertaker is six foot ten. I'm at six foot two max, so I could never be that physical presence like The Undertaker. He could just stand in the ring, look at you, and the crowd would be well over and believe that straight away. But with Raven, he just the psychology in the ring, he just come over, sit by the corner, wait for the belt to go off, and then just work a real psychological match from there. I'm a big guy, so I'm going to probably take bumps harder than, you know, say a fellow who's 12 stone. I'm at 21 and a half stone, so when I land in the ring, I'm going to make a fairly big impact. But I did a little bit of it up in Bray, and just once you land right, it's fine. You know, um, but I've never gone against, I've never really worked with a fellow of a similar size to me. So I'm not used to being, say, thrown around much. But I think just with training, there should be no problem with that. You know, that's why I'm here. I'm here to learn. The seminar with Blake was just unreal. It was really great, you know. He talked just about the psychology behind it. He talked about the moves, about how matches go. I mean, he just did a kind of a really quick, basic match, but he got every point over straight away and there was no bs at all through it he i thought it was just fantastic you know i couldn't say a bad word about it and he talked to all of us individually which i thought was great it wasn't just oh here's a group of people yeah yeah you're going to be next uh, wwe champion yeah yeah whatever but no it was really great and i really enjoyed it hey come along brother hey how are we doing boys okay <laughs> Let, let's see what we got Okay, good. Now hang on. Okay, so lock on up and then relax. And stay right there. Okay, stay right there. Okay, now this is the collar. That's the elbow right down there. Got the collar. Good. The collar there and the elbow. Okay, come on over to the side, brother. Okay, I'll see it again. Um, my name is Jamie Lovato. I'm from Grand. Um, came to the seminar today. Uh, I had a big passion for wrestling for, since I was eight years of age. So. Getting back into it, I used to do it in CPW up in Inchicore in Dublin. So getting back into it again, back into the training side of it and working from there. Uh, just trying to make a name for myself, see how I get on and stuff like that. So, um, like I missed it, so I, I wanted to get back to it again. Like it was something I always wanted to do, even at a young age. Like So I've been watching it for years and so it'd be good to get back into it again. You said you previously trained. How did you find that? Um, at the start, it was very, I was very nervous at the start because I went straight into heavy stuff, like straight away, even frog splashes, taking bumps, figure four leg locks, stuff like that. I mean, I was, I just actually went straight into it because I thought Blake had a big passion for it, and Blake was like, "Well, we're going to go for it and see how we get on." Took a few bumps, like I was nervous first taking the bump. I mean, you're looking at the floor, you're like, "Oh my God, what am I doing here?" Like, and I took my first body slam. I, yeah. That didn't go down so well at all, to be honest. I was like looking up at your man, your man was about seven foot, and I was like, oh, what, what am I doing down here? Like, but I said to myself, it's, it, pain is you know, part of life, that's, that's all part of life. So I went for it and just kept going from there. I just got into wrestling when I was very young, as like anyone else did in a sense. Uh, literally, watching wrestlers, like I used to watch, like, uh, Mr. Perfect, Bret Hart, but there's more managers I actually took notice of when I was growing up. Like Paul Barrow, uh, Bobby Heen, and James Mitchell. Like as Blake said today, not a lot of people actually give praise to Sherry Martell with Shawn Michaels. Like I was looking at them, and want, wanting to be the next them. They said wanting to be in the next Rock, the next Stone Cold. 
I wanted to be the next manager. Like, I mean, I know Wayne, cause I went to school with Wayne, not in that same classroom, but we were at the same school and stuff like that, so he's a big passion for wrestling. Like, I, I had friends that just, I had friends at the moment, they don't, they're like, why, why are you interested in wrestling for, you know, da, 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 da. but like, it, it's my life, it's always been my life, do you know what I mean? Like, dad and singing, I'm a big singer as well, so love that as well, but wrestling is the main, the main thing, like, for me, so it'd be good to get back in there again, like. It, it does hurt, like, the next day you're hurting, the following morning you are in bits. I mean, you can break a bone, you can break a leg, you can break an arm, you know, you can break a hand even. But, like, I mean, people I think it's fake, they want to step between the ropes and figure out it's not like. And the same question to yourself, do you think that wrestling gets a bad rap I from people? I think it gets a very bad rap. Like, literally, I, I have friends that they have passion for birds, they have passion for dogs and stuff like that. Like, my passion's for wrestling. Yeah. If they tell me it's fake, I'm not going to tell them, literally, that they're not going to be so much what they're doing with the dogs and the birds and whatever. Like, it's it's my passion. Leave it be mine, not not theirs. Boom. That's it. Okay. Now, relax a bit. That's coming a little bit strong. So just relax a little bit. There. And again. Good. A little bit further up here. And again. Good. It was awesome. I mean, like the guys. I mean, like, it's, it's any school you ever start. I mean, you got guys showing up who are going to go all the way. You got guys showing up who are just here for a week. You got guys showing up who will be great athletes, guys showing up who've never set foot in the ring before. I mean, the important thing is that this is where everybody wants to be today, at this time, at this moment, and to make it warm and welcoming and to be honest about what it is. And each day that they train, for as long as they train, let them get the most out of it, you know? So everybody's, everybody's here on a different path to trajectory. How long they'll stay here, who knows? But uh, today was really great. Anybody can do anything that they put their heart to. And you know, the business, like anything else, changes so quickly. Um, what promotions you can work for, where in the world you can work, where you can make money, what the promoters are looking for, these things always change. But the one thing that never changes is, if you have passion and you commit yourself to something fully and you do it the way you believe in, to the absolute best of your ability, there's always going to be a place out there for you. And if nothing else, even if nobody else in the world ever sees it, which is rarely the case, but even if that's the case, if you're doing what you love, the way you want to do it, it's good for the soul. That's, that's what we're meant to be doing. You want to show people how to do everything safely, how to move around the ring, how to take falls, the whole nine yards. Um, that's, that's kind of like your basic grammar for wrestling. Uh, after that, especially when people are ready to put matches together, then you really start talking about the character, about why you're doing what you're doing, how to put the holds together, what style suits you versus somebody else. Somebody would be suited great by doing something athletic where somebody else is better at doing something more power wrestling and someone else might have a different style, you know. So um, we start with the basic moves and then we try to tailor them to each person individually for the type of person that they are. I suppose for anybody thinking about it, what kind of words of encouragement would you have for them if they considered coming to a session in the future? If you want to do it, do it. Doesn't matter if it's wrestling or, you know, go-karting or, or skydiving. Trust yourself and go with it. Every time that we listen to ourselves and we trust our, our spirit and we, we cast aside the things that scare us and we move forward, it's good for us. It gives us energy and power and it incites energy and power in the people that we love and we care about. This might be the whole thing for the rest of your life and it might, might not be. It might be just a part of your journey. But if it's part of your journey today and you believe in it, go for it. You won't regret it. The moves in pro wrestling are like the words in a book. The actual words themselves are not what sell it. It is the order in which that they are presented. It's the same thing in pro wrestling. To know what order to present the moves in, it's important to know who you are. Once you know who you are, that's what we spent today talking about. Once you know who you are, who you're representing, what your goals are, everything becomes obvious. It's like one foot in front of the other. It's like, once you learn how to walk, you, I don't think about putting my left foot in front of my right anymore, I just do it. Same thing in wrestling. When you get used to all the wrestling holes that we're gonna teach you, you don't have to think about, ooh, what, what's the next move? You'll naturally feel it. The baby face will fire up and you'll go, ah, and you'll run away. Or, you know, you'll be fighting back and you'll see an opening and you'll slam them down and you'll fall over because you're exhausted. You know, you'll feel it when you get there. The most important thing is you know why you're doing it, you trust yourself, and you work as hard as you can, be as honest as you can, and make it your business. As long as you are enjoying what you do, as long as you love it and you're doing the way you believe, don't let anybody tell you that you're doing it wrong, because you're not. The only people who are doing it wrong are the people who are trying to tear down other people. As long as you're trying to build yourself up, you're doing it the absolute right way.